Um, if you're not speaking, please remember to keep your mic muted. Um, while our speakers are presenting, if you have comments, questions, please use the chat feature. Um, and then when we open it up for Q&A, we definitely will be able to uh, unmute and, and, and let you guys speak. So, Mary Jo, next slide. So kind of just a, a brief agenda, sort of following our normal agenda that we normally have. Um, the order is to be determined. Dean Flax in a meeting with President Pinto right now, and if he finishes up in time, he will be our first speaker um, and sort of give us an update on, on what's going on in the College of Medicine. Um, if not, or after, um, Dr. Aurora Bennett's going to give us an update on the match and, and some other specific things um, and, and talk a little bit about Honors Day. And then we're going to have an update from two of our M1s um, uh, from the Medical Student Association, kind of getting their perspective on how things are going and what's going on from the student perspective in the College of Medicine. Next slide. Again, um, just most of you have used Teams. Um, we've used this platform a couple of times, so you can see the icons. There's the chat feature if you want to post a question or a comment. Um, please, if you want, we love to see your faces. So if you want to, please feel free to turn your webcam on. You do not have to. And then if you're not speaking, um, please um, mute your mic. And then when the, the meeting is over, of course, there is the leave button. Next slide, Mary Jo. Um, again, we're going to have questions after the speakers. Again, you can put them in the chat function and I'll sort of moderate that. Um, and if you are on by phone and obviously unable to use the chat um, function, just please, you know, when it's time for questions, unmute your phone, introduce yourself, and, and please ask your question. Mary Jo? I'm trying to get rid of this share screen. So before we begin, I just wanted to add a couple of sort of updates and announcements. Um, I wanted to, two things I wanted to um, sort of give everybody an update on. The first was the reunion experience wine tasting um, and class catch up that we had about a month ago. Um, we had 100 people attend um, from the classes ending in zero and five, since as you all know, we weren't able to meet in person last year. And it really was a fun time. Um, you know, John was on there, so, and some other people were on there. Patty was on there. It was a it was a really fun time. Um, we had um, a, a wine maker from California, um, Tobin James Sellers, Toby Shumrick, whose dad um, was the founder of the ENT division at UC College of Medicine. And it was just, it, we, we got to experience four different wines and then we all broke up into into our separate classes. So it was almost like kind of a little mini reunion. And I know our class, we had a blast. Um, it was a lot of fun. And in fact, many of my classmates have reached out and um, have asked us to kind of do it again. So I think we're gonna organize on our own, just a, you know, a little virtual happy hour. And, um, you know, some of the feedback I got, we're gonna do it a little bit later in the evening for some of our West Coast colleagues. It was, a, it was at six o'clock, which for some of our California Californians and, and West Coast people was a little hard to attend, but Mary Jo, I don't know if you got any other feedback or if any of the other class reps that were there, but I, it was a great time. I had a blast. So um, thank you for all of you that attended. The other update I wanted to um, share with you um, and also a thank you. So um, last Thursday was the annual day of giving for University of Cincinnati as a whole. Um, we did it a little bit differently. I was actually part of the, 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 of the planning committee and for about the last nine months, we had gotten together once a month to sort of sort of really re-energize and, and reinvigorate the day of giving. Instead of doing it from midnight to midnight, which is when it's been done the last few years, we decided to kick it off at noon um, so that we could sort of make a big deal of that first hour and, and everybody would actually be awake for it. So it ran from noon on the 15th to noon on the 16th. Um, we highlighted several um, programs. I know the university as a whole had over almost 3,000 gifts. I think they raised over $2 million. Um, I wanted to give you some highlights from the College of Medicine. So in general, UC College of Medicine and UC Health had 125 gifts totaling over $30,000. Um, I, I was um, one of the ambassadors and, and I was kind of um, sort of featuring the, the Lucy Oxley um, scholarship this year. And we were able to get 44 gifts to the Lucy Oxley Scholarship, which raised $5,700. And then that was matched um, by the Hagen's match. So phenomenal job there. Um, I have a Dean Scholarship. Um, 
even though it wasn't a featured program this year, we're going to feature that for the um, Thanksgiving Tuesday giving. Um, that still raised, there were 24 gifts for that. So thank you for all of you that that gave and reached out to your classmates and, and asked them to participate. Um, was was a very successful was a very successful day of giving. So and I know um, Kim and Gabe will talk a little bit more about an update on giving later in the meeting. Mary Jo, where are we going next? Is Andy on? So or am I... it looks like Dr. Falak is still in his meeting. So um, yep, Dr. Bennett. So um, it's not my pleasure um, to welcome back Aurora Bennett. Um, as you know, Dr. Bennett's the Associate Dean for Student Affairs and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science. And today she's gonna give us an update on sort of the M4s as they are looking to graduate. Um, in fact, I have a fourth year student um, with me this month. Today is her last day of, of fourth year. Um, so she was very excited and just an overview of a very successful match day. So Aurora, welcome and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. I will share my screen. Um, first, let me thank all of you for the scholarship funds. That is so meaningful uh, to our student body. Uh, it really has helped us to be able to recruit just an amazingly uh, uh, talented group of students. Each year we're in awe of, of the talent that comes our way. And certainly those scholarship dollars have really, really helped. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we wanted to give you a little bit of uh, an update about the match this year and some of the events that lead up to uh, our match. Things have really changed since I was in medical school. Um, now we have a whole series of sessions, panels, et cetera, to really help our students uh, narrow down that specialty decision and really begins in that very first year where we even talk to them about, you know, what is that road to residency? We are fortunate to have such good collaborations with so many physicians at UCOM and in our community who um, serve on panels to talk with our students about their own specialty that they're in, what's a day in the life, um, et cetera, uh, answer all the students' questions about that. We also, um, our more senior students will serve on panels uh, to help students realize that that journey to finding a specialty really can take time. And sometimes you come into medical school thinking that you're going to be one specialty and then you're shocked at what really, really pulls at your heart. Uh, we do several class meetings to help them plan, you know, that third year when they're doing their clerkships, they often want to give some thought to what's the order of the clerkships that makes sense based on my current interests as far as specialties. And they do have, you know, some ability to um, uh, go into a lottery and really see what that, that path might look like. All of our various departments at UCOM uh, do a great job. They each have um, a meeting that's specifically for medical students to talk about their department, their specialty, their, their career path, et cetera. And um, then we also have advisors in each of the departments that can help our very young students in their first two years, as well as really getting into much more granular discussions with our third years, et cetera. And um, as you all may recall, that summer between first and second year is, is the last summer um, in life. And so um, many of our students look for opportunities to do research, uh, engage with our urban health project that does service across so many of our local communities. Um, so we do a whole week of kind of giving them ideas about what are all the possibilities for that summer and helping them to edit their CV so that it is ready to apply for research positions, et cetera. And then of course, many, many shadowing opportunities. COVID impacted that. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the impact of COVID on some of the clinical exposure of our students. In third year, um, they are assigned an advisor. Uh, and that advisor either comes from our Office of Student Affairs or the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion or from our medical sciences training program, our MD-PhD program. 
And that advisor they meet with in the fall of their third year to discuss at that point, you know, what are they thinking as far as specialties? Let's look at their academic record. Let's look at what else they've been involved in, research, service, whatever, to see uh, what more do they need to do to help them narrow their decision to make them the most competitive applicant for that specialty that they have an interest in. Again, we continue with class meetings in that fourth year they have a year of electives to choose from, so they're not accustomed to that. Usually, you know, we're dictating kind of what they need to do. And so it can be a little overwhelming. So we help them plan, especially that first part of fourth year when they want to do electives to either finalize their specialty decision or for those who know their specialty to do some rotations to get letters of recommendations or also to do a visiting elective at another program. Again. That was not a possibility for the current fourth year class because of COVID, but it is reopening up for our rising fourth years so that they can go and do a visiting elective and really um, shine at a program that they're very interested in. Our residency program directors also do small group um, panels for our students. They um, Our students can choose uh, various specialties to go and hear directly from the program directors about the training experience, the life, etc. And then our M4s who just went through the match will do small groups for our rising M4s to talk about, you know, what was I asked about on interviews? What are those most important parts of your application, um, etc. So nothing like having kind of that near peer mentoring. That is one of the favorite aspects of our program for our students. And then, of course, their career advisor that they had a one on one meeting. They maintain contact with that advisor all the way through the match. In the fourth year, we uh, schedule another meeting with our advisee, um, despite however, however many other meetings we've had or now so many virtual meetings to really talk very specifically and review their application in ARIS. Um, I remember when I applied, I just submitted my application. Um, now, you know, we really can offer so much more to our students to really review that application with them. Are they really presenting their, their best selves on that application? We review their personal statement. We also have grad students um, from the main campus who are majoring in English to review their personal statements for grammar etc. And um, also helping the students to tailor that personal statement to the specialty that they're interested in. What does that specialty look like in a look for in a personal statement? So we help them with that. Uh, we also show them their MSPE previously called the Dean's Letter so that they know what we have included in that. Um, should they have taken a leave of absence or if they had any academic blemishes, they know exactly those text boxes that ask us those questions and they know exactly what we have said in those. Um, and then of course it, it, it provides all their grades with the transcript and all of their clerkship narratives. Um, we talk with them about how many applications to submit based on their competitiveness for the specialty that they're interested in. Um, also looking at how competitive are the programs they're applying to to make sure they also have some in that mid range and a bit more of a safety range. Some of our students are applying in the couples match, so they really have to negotiate, you know, some of those cities that have the greatest ability to maybe match both of them in the same city because of the numbers of programs they have. And then we also have some students who may not be as optimally competitive for that specialty as they would like to be. So we actually have many conversations about you know, do you want to apply to a second specialty in case you don't match in the specialty that you want? Um, and we talk about how that all works. Um, how do you apply to a parallel program? So many discussions around that. And then, of course, our specialty advisors um, from that specialty they're applying to are so helpful in helping them think about which programs they should apply to based on their interests, geographic interests, what they want from their training and which programs might they be the most competitive for. So a lot of people on their team helping them um, before they submit that application. So COVID, COVID definitely had an impact. Our fourth years uh, were pulled from their clinical rotations. They had to work remotely 
um, doing um, online aquifer cases, other kinds of remote learning experiences. And for the most part returned, instead of an eight week rotation, they did a couple of weeks in person. Um, our current third years have three of their clerkships sh shortened from eight weeks to six weeks. Those are medicine, surgery, and pediatrics. Um, our fourth years that went through the match, uh, again, they could not do visiting electives because of all of the travel restrictions. So many programs offered virtual uh, visiting electives, some of it trying to market their programs, some of it with actual discussion of cases, um, et cetera, so that the students could get some, some sense of those programs, the people, their residents. Um, and then interview season was not in person. It was all virtual, just as we're meeting today. And so many programs really um, tried to market themselves virtually. They provided kind of social hours with their residents for students to get a sense of the camaraderie, uh, what the residents' perspective is on their lives in this program, and then to give them obviously information about the training and a virtual tour or links um, to have tours of their program, their city, et cetera. And then even unfortunately, our match day could not be in person. Um, so we worked with our fourth year students who are much more tech savvy than us. And uh, we used a combination of Zoom and Facebook Live um, to have a live stream um, match experience with students telling each other where they matched, what specialty, et cetera. Um, really, it was as lively and entertaining as a virtual um, experience could be, but I think they actually had a lot of a lot of fun with it. To look at our match outcomes, so if we look at our match percentage prior to SOAP, what, what we used to call the scramble, uh, we had 90 of our, our 175 students, we had 97% matched. Um, our average is that 94% of our students are matched prior to SOAP or the scramble, and that is right in line with the national average. Um, this year, the national average went down a little bit to 93%, so we were really thrilled with our 97%. Then our students go through SOAP, which again is a very different experience than the old scramble where everybody would fax their applications and call programs. Now it's a it's really uh, a very scheduled uh, week where students can send 45 applications through ARIS um, to one or more specialties. The program directors can review those applications, do virtual interviews, and there are, uh, this year there were four rounds, kind of four match rounds where the program directors could rank those students that they interviewed virtually in their order of preference, whereas the students do not get to rank the programs in SOAP. And so you do virtual offer rounds. And at the end of, of that experience, we had 99% of our students matched, um, which has been typical for us. Uh, and in the past um, four year, five years, um, we have uh, those students who had not matched at the end of SOAP have since matched. Um, into a program. And we don't have data nationally about what happens after SOAP, how to compare, but again, we do very well. Our couples matched, they were 100% uh, matched, our couples, and our average has been 99%, although again, um, our, we have 100% of our couples matched um, now, even those who did not match in a prior year. The national average for couples is 93%. We do have the occasional student that instead of going through SOAP, um, they prefer to go do a year of research and to reapply to that specialty that they're interested in. That is common in some of the more competitive specialties, um, such as orthopedic surgery or plastic surgery, dermatology, uh, where they, really, they will value that additional year of um, research for the student. Our top five specialties that students matched into uh, were these with um, internal medicine at the top um, and psychiatry has really gained traction. Um, psychiatry used to be relatively uh, less competitive and it has in the last four years uh, really gone up in its competitive. I will say that it is in a middle tier of competitiveness now uh, where uh, when you look at what programs have unfilled positions I think there were just maybe uh, two or three unfilled positions in psychiatry. 
Um, I think students have really um, enjoyed the field, the neuroscience, the lifestyle, et cetera. Um, so that's been kind of a surprise. Um, geographically, many of our students stay right here in Ohio, and then we can see followed by New York, given that it has so many residency programs, um, Pennsylvania, and then um, these other states at 4%. Here locally, where did, our, where did our students match in programs? We had 32 match to our UC programs in a variety of specialties. Um, and when I, I have general uh, surgery here, and that means it's a combination of those who match to the categorical general surgery, as well as maybe just a prelim year um, in general surgery. Um, all who matched to Jewish did so for a preliminary internal medicine year um, with those students having plans to go on to their advanced position, be it in anesthesia, radiology, a number of other um, specialties. And then Christ Hospital, same thing. We had four of our students match at Children's Hospital for pediatrics, three at Good Sam for general surgery, and one at Bethesda for family medicine. <clears throat> And that really uh, summarizes um, some of what we wanted to share. I will say that our Honors Day um, last year was virtual, and this year we are very much looking um, forward to having, hopefully, an in-person um, Honors Day. We are planning for both, both in-person and virtual, uh, just in case um, the surge you know, comes back again full force but we are very much hoping to have an in-person ceremony as are our students. And we'll be doing that at our fifth third arena here on campus. So we are very actively planning for that. But let me open it up to your questions. I'm, I'm happy to talk a bit more about areas that are of interest to you. Great, thank you very much, Aurora. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, Bill Knight had uh, posted a question in the chat, wanted to get your opinion on what was the biggest way you saw this virtual world impact the whole interview and matching process? He's heard both good and bad, I think as all of us have from program directors as well as students. I think for, I think programs were nervous that they really could not give our students a true sense of their program and they might be in cities that students have never visited. So they worried that that would hurt their match. Students likewise, did not get to experience maybe the culture of a program in a different city, um, especially for some of those specialties that really value the student doing a visiting elective. Some of the competitive surgical subspecialties, uh, dermatology, radiation oncology, et cetera. Um, and so I think that was hard for our students to visit the cities, um, to really meet the they usually have a dinner with the residents, lunch with the residents, really get a sense of the camaraderie that's there. On the plus side, they saved a heck of a lot of money uh, not having to travel for interviews. Doing it virtually was definitely a money saver, both for programs and for students. Um, I think that given how well our match went, uh, we were not hurt by it. We were worried about that. Um, but actually, it's been one of, actually, I will say it's probably the best match we have had in the last decade. So our students, our faculty, our advisors worked very hard uh, to really do our best given this virtual scenario that we were in. There, I had to unmute, sorry. Great, thank you. Um, other questions, please just feel free to unmute introduce yourself and ask a question. While people are thinking of a question or are ask you a question, it's really more, I think, for not this upcoming next year's match, but probably the match after that. Where, what are you guys doing and how do you think um, step one going to pass fail, how's that gonna affect sort of how programs are granting interviews and how they're ranking students? Well, that is top of mind. <laughs> um, so we heard that it, that will officially occur January 26th of 2022. Any student who takes step one on or after that date will only receive a grade of pass or fail and will not receive the three digit numerical score. So we've been talking, actually we just this week had a panel with uh, a few of our residency program directors um, Pediatrics, general surgery, and emergency medicine were represented. 
And, you know, they really, um, and this was for our first and second year students. And obviously our first year students will be the first class to be impacted by this. And it was really helpful for them to hear, you know, yes, we use step one because all students take that and it helps give a, it helps to give us a sense of, you know, where you are with medical knowledge. But does it really predict, you know, who's going to be our best residents and physicians? No, not necessarily. So I think programs are really uh, looking at much more holistic reviews and they talk to our students, you know. We, we certainly can see your grades on clerkships. We'll be able to see your step two CK, but we're looking beyond that too. Who are you? What have you invested your time in besides studying for medical school? Were you such a pioneer with uh, really service opportunities or your research, how you talk about that, how interested you are, who you are interpersonally. They, they read those clerkship narratives to have a sense of, you know, are you a team player? Do you really work to make sure that that team gets all of their work done by the end of the day to best serve patients, et cetera? So it was really helpful for them to hear that the review is much more holistic and they're very interested in who this applicant is as a person and that window they have into how are they as a very new clinician. I think that's great. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a positive step. I always share students a story. I had a former UC student who did a month with me as a fourth year student and we were talking. It was in October. She was applying. I did my P's residency at Riley in Indianapolis and I asked her if she applied there and she said she did, but she didn't get an interview. And then she confided into me that she had actually not passed step one the first time. And I happened to be very good friends with the program director and she was a phenomenal student. I reached out to him and said, you know, would you be willing to relook at her application? You know, she's a phenomenal student. I talked to him a little bit. They ended up interviewing her and she ended up matching there. And so it, it's just, you know, I, I'm I, the thing I worry about now is and I know you guys are dealing with this and maybe Andy will talk about it a little bit. And you but, you know, I, I worry that now other things are going to have maybe weighted importance that that's going to put it's going to shift the stress to different things. And so I don't know if that's going to be step two. I know there's some discussion about pass fail in the curriculum and 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 um, shelf score. So just be interested. Thanks for all you do. Just be interested to sort of see as we go through how this all how this all um, plays out. Um, Dr. Lewis has a question for you. I wanted to know if you could provide any high level updates on diversity, equity, and inclusion at the College of Medicine. And it's and Chris, at some point we'll, we'll invite me and Mallory back on, but or if you want to kind of maybe just give a little bit of a global, I know um, you're aware it's not necessarily your area, but maybe just an update to the group. Of course, of course. Um, actually, we just had a town hall last evening um, where uh, we invited all of our students from underrepresented, uh, sorry, underrepresented uh, groups in medicine. Uh, with our senior associate dean, Dr. Diller, um, Dr. Baker, our associate dean for medical education, and several others. Um, something that we have found as we've been analyzing a lot of our academic data is that our underrepresented students uh, tend to struggle a bit more with some of with standardized testing. And uh, that can, uh, in some ways, hamper their ability to really be ranked as highly and, you know, might it impact the specialty decision they make, et cetera. So we're taking a very close look at that. And, and so one of the things that we see is um, underrepresented students, especially female underrepresented students, uh, might not score as high on step one, step two, and in some of our um, standardized MBME exams that occur throughout our curriculum. So we're taking a look, especially in year three, at how we use that score uh, and might we uh, give that less weight to really highlight uh, the clinical strengths of all of our students. Because when we look at the evaluations from our preceptors, there is no difference among our students, regardless of gender or um, their underrepresented uh, background. And also for some of our other um, uh, evaluations that are done, uh, for the most part, there are not many differences. It tends to be those standardized exams. And as we talk to program directors, you know, program directors, they want to know that students can pass standardized exams ultimately because they have to continue to take those. But they're really looking at 
again, a more holistic picture of the student, their clinical skills. So we really want to work toward highlighting the clinical skills of our students, um, their, their ability to be a team player, their, their interactions with patients, um, all of those things that we know ultimately really make that ideal physician. And we want, we want to certainly have our students match in a variety of specialties so that, again, our patients want physicians who look like them, who have had some shared experiences. And I think we are working hard toward doing better in that area. So thank you, Dr. Lewis, for, for raising that question. And, and we I, miss you. And I know the Pete side, Corky Lehman, who's the clerkship director at the College of Medicine, is involved in some national studies looking at um, bias on, at least in pediatrics evaluation. So um, we have time for one more question um, for Dr. Bennett. And I'm gonna let Dr. Weikert, who's patiently raised her hand and, and let her unmute and ask Aurora her question. Go ahead, Ann. Hi, I, I, um, my son is you and he interviews prospective students and he says that it he thinks it's a disaster that it, this has gone to the pass fail situation um for this step one test and then of course with these virtual interviews it's just impossible to kind of um filter out people as well because you really have to have people who are can show their commitment and that you know that they've got the background so even though we've, we're saying all these nice things and it's somewhat ideal, I think, to say it's a perfect situation doing it this way. I, I'm not sure it's going to work out, but it's just another perspective. Sure, sure. Well, it's a change, right? And everyone is is looking at, you know, there's been a very heavy reliance on step one as one of the filters to, um, you know, they get, our program directors get so many applications. They have to filter them in some way to narrow down that group that they're gonna do a more holistic review on. Um, but I think, you know, I really hear program directors, not only ours, but those across the country saying, you know, we, we have to start looking more holistically. And yes, we'll still have that step two CK. Our medical students will take step two CK earlier than they have so that we make sure they have a score. Um, but we also, I think, you know, looking at those clerkship narratives too, where, uh, you know, what, what was that student like on a clinical rotation? How did they interact with the team, with patients? What was their work ethic? Um, all of those things that, um, you know, I think are important and it kind of is pushing uh, program directors to look a little bit more closely at everything that a student brings to the table, much like Dr. Paltier's um, example, that some students maybe that would have been overlooked in the past, I think hopefully we'll get a closer look, uh, which I think ultimately, hopefully will be very, very good um, for our profession. Well, thanks, Aurora. Thanks for spending time with us. And again, you're more than welcome to, if you've got time, we'd love for you to stay on our call. If, if not, we appreciate it. And thanks for all you do for the students. I know they thank really you. appreciate it. So thank you all very much. Thanks, Aurora. All right. Um, Dean Flack is, is um, back just for meeting with President Pinto and um, is going to give us sort of a global update on the College of Medicine and UC Health. Andy, welcome. Good morning. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, everyone. It's uh, good to see uh, some of you this morning. Uh, I can only see some of you on the screen at any given time. I can't see the whole uh, group here. <laughs> I don't know if Aurora is staying on or not, but uh, yeah, I hope she is able to for a little bit longer uh, to do that and appreciate her jumping in, picking up a little bit early for me uh, and doing this because I did get delayed a little bit by uh, a board of trustees. Uh, session. So just to pro provide you a little bit of updates and as usual, I prefer conversations rather than monologues. So please feel free at any point in time to just raise your hand if you have a question or just jump in and interrupt me and uh, to pursue things like that. Uh, but one of the things, you know, uh, you know, the honor and privilege of being Dean when you have the opportunity to work with great people like Aurora, uh, just the fantastic job that she does. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. It makes my job easy uh, because I have really, really good team uh, that is working and doing you know, incredible things. As, as Aurora you know, clearly you know, remarked, 
the world is changing and we have to adapt to some of the changes that are going on. Whether we like them or not, we can't control all the things that are going on. Uh, there's people that are split over pass fail, people split over you know, the testing parts of it, and we just have to find ways to continue to move forward and to make sure our students uh, really succeed and do the best that they can. And uh, I think we saw with the match uh, this year, as uh, Aurora described to you, uh, our students did extremely well. I think our school has a really good reputation. So I'll start a little bit about this, and, and if we've talked about these already, uh, please let me know and, and we can stop. But just a little bit of rankings and national rankings. I don't particularly care for a lot of the national rankings and the methodologies that come about, but it's always good to, when you're moving up, uh, to at least move up in the rankings and to do the things at that. So I'm gonna talk about two of them a little bit. And one is US News and World Report. And that is one that, I, you know, my personal opinion, it is, uh, you know, terrible methodology. Uh, the, and pretty useless in a lot of different ways, but it's used by a lot of people. Just like a step one score was used for residency selection when it isn't designed to be used for that, it's a licensing exam, but uh, the, dip, the difference of a 239 or a 240 on step one was actually meaningless if you look at the uh, look at that, but it was used as a cutoff sometime for getting into a specialty and things like that. So when you look at things like that, how, pe how things get misused, I think U.S. News and World Report is one of those where people look at those. However, this year we did rise from 44 to 42 in the national rankings, so it's always good to see we're moving upward uh, in those rankings. And that's among all medical schools, both uh, allopathic and osteopathic medical schools are now included in that listing uh, for that. This year they put in a couple new areas, one that I haven't full, I don't fully understand yet, which is diversity. And we actually were ranked number 17 in diversity, which I think is really, really good. However, my concern there is not knowing fully how that was calculated. And my understanding is several schools have challenged that and said data was incorrect and things like that. Next year, depending on how the uh, data is used and what data they use for that. I have no idea where, we'll, where we will stand with that. But it was great to see that we were ranked, you know, uh, quite highly as far as their diversity index um, at this point in time to do that. Another one that we follow pretty closely is the Blue Ridge rankings. And this is actually rankings based on research productivity. And it really focuses mainly on NIH funding. Uh, and a few other grants like that. And this year we jumped from uh, 65 to 56 in the Blue Ridge rankings. So there's a, a pretty significant jump, which shows the, you know, our research enterprise where we have been sliding a little bit, we've turned turned that around. And I think we're really doing well as far as that. Several of our programs, 10 of our 16 departments rose in the Blue Ridge rankings. So that's really good to see that it's a consistent thing. Neurology in particular deserves a shout out. They went up 16 places. Uh, that's a pretty big jump in there. Uh, emergency medicine actually went up 28 places. Uh, but just to show you how rankings go, and, and they'll be the first one, they got one huge grant and that made them jump up quite a bit. That isn't gonna be sustainable for a long term, you know, with that, you know, with one huge grant every year coming in. So those rankings will fluctuate a little bit based on that uh, and how one grant can actually influence things tremendously. So when we look at rankings, we always wanna look at, uh, you know, what is the data that goes behind them, how to interpret them, what their appropriate use is, uh, and uh, you know, how to use those appropriately like that. But overall, I think it's very positive that the College of Medicine is really on an upward trend in so many different ways. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm now at the College of Medicine. It doesn't mean we don't have some glitches. Uh, one of the areas, you know, just to talk about is uh, we have we announced a few weeks ago a, the recruitment of a new chair for the Department of Internal Medicine, John Bird. Dr. Bird is coming down from uh, the Ohio State University. Uh, and we really think uh, uh, John is going to be a game changer. Really appreciate the great work of Greg Ruan for the past 10 years, uh, serving as chair of the department and bringing it to a point where we're able to recruit someone of the caliber of John. John is going to help not just with the department, but he's a national and internationally recognized cancer researcher. And so also is going to really help us move uh, UCCC, the University of Cincinnati Cancer Center, 
along also. So, you know, we're really pleased with that. We are already processing some people that will be coming because of John. He's already had a positive effect on, you know, recruiting uh, for the Cancer Center and for other programs. So that's going to be really, really helpful and really good for us, uh, bringing John on board. And we have two other searches that we have ongoing right now. Miles Penzak is stepping down from otolaryngology, head and neck surgery uh, as of the end of June. And we have an internal search for a new chair of that department uh, that is actively underway now. And the Department of Environmental and Public Health Services uh, also. Uh, Glenn Talaska is serving as uh, interim chair. He's been doing that for about two years since Chuck Mayho left to go to Arkansas. And so we are recruiting a new chair for that department. So there's a lot of uh, changes going on, a lot of recruitments going on for faculty, for staff uh, that are that are really, really important. Uh, just a couple other quick things to mention, a couple things at the university level and uh, Vice Provost uh, Lewis should feel free to jump in and correct uh, any misstatements, misstatements that I make or anything that he wants to add to this. Uh, it's great having one of us. Uh, from the College of Medicine, and in particular for me, great having a family doc uh, over in the provost's office uh, to work with. Chris is a great supporter, and it's great to have uh, uh, an in in that office. But his boss, Christy Nelson, has also been a very, very strong supporter of the College of Medicine. So Provost Nelson is retiring, uh, hopefully for, from her perspective at the end of June. Uh, they are at, actively recruiting at the university level uh, for a new provost. There are five candidates, five finalists for that position that are being invited to come in for interviews, wide ranging interviews with various groups and, and things like that. So uh, input on any of those candidates would be really, really helpful. Um, so we can recruit a provost that's continue in Christie's shoes to really move the university forward. Uh, the university is doing well. My understanding is that numbers for the fall are higher than they were for last year, which was the highest ever for the university. So the university continues to grow. And uh, the next lives, next lives here strategic uh, direction that Dr. Pinto is leading us into, uh, especially with the digital futures, is really ramping up and doing extremely well. So there's a lot of positive things going on at the university level. Um, one area, as I said, we're recruiting for a new chair of the Department of Environmental and Public Health Services. At the same time, you know, Chris and Phil Diller and Anil Menon from the College of Medicine have really led the initiative to create an undergraduate degree in public health. Uh, they amazed me, uh, and I thought it'd be another year or two, at least, before we would have a uh, full program up and running and started to starting a major in public health, but we actually have a major in public health that's starting in the fall with students recruited into the public health program. Uh, taking a lot of work, they did it in an unbelievable uh, approach involving, I think it's nine colleges across the university participating in this program. And I think that's going to be a, an excellent addition to both the university and to the College of Medicine. And then we also have approved a, an MD, MPH program now also. So, so for medical students, some recruited in into that program, but others who will be able to take that uh, who have already in the College of Medicine. So both of those programs are improved, uh, are, have been approved, and I think they're moving uh, in really good directions. At the university level, um, and just having you know, been at the uh, you know, session with the, with the Board of Trustees, um, there's changes at that level. Also, board members are appointed for nine year terms. Ginger Warner had been uh, on the board for nine years, so her term ended in December. Ginger was also a very strong advocate for the College of Medicine, uh, for the health sciences. She chaired the health affairs committee at the board for a long period of time uh, when she was on the board. Uh, you know, she stepped down and Jill Magruder uh, is, has replaced her and her first board meeting will be next week uh, for that. So there's more going on yeah, at, at the board level also. And I uh, just wanted uh, to make you aware that, uh, of those changes also. Um, I don't know much about this, but you probably read that there's a new basketball coach that's always 
you know, exciting also. That does affect, you know, the College of Medicine in, in strange ways also, because the, the more publicity and the better our sports teams do, the more people look, even for medical school here. Because if you look at the U.S. News and World Report, there's a good chunk of their uh, methodology that actually is reputational index. And if people don't know you, know about you, they don't rank you like that. So having a good basketball team, having a good football team actually even helps with the reputational index for the College of Medicine, which helps us in rankings too. So people sometimes wonder why I get worried about basketball teams and stuff like that. One is, I like the sports, but also, uh, you know, the university's reputation, uh, we're part of the university, and that is really important to us. Um, finally, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, COVID and the pandemic. Aurora did a great job trying to some of the changes that needed to be made. So I'm not gonna go over uh, some of those. Happy to answer any questions, but just for what we're expecting in the fall, uh, and the fall semester starts for us in August. Uh, our new students will be starting the first week of August here at the medical school. Um, and we're expecting more, much more of a return to normal uh, with the campus. Um, all throughout the campus, undergraduate also. Uh, masking will likely still be required. Uh, and so that'll be still uh, something there. Um, we'll also be looking at physical distancing and looking at that requirement as far as the classrooms, but really bringing people back, you know, for the small groups and the other activities that we can handle, uh, we're gonna be bringing back uh, to campus. So it should be a much more vibrant, I think that was the word that uh, President Pinto used, which I think is a really good one. Uh, back to having a vibrant campus. It's uh, when I come in here, it can be pretty dead at times in the medical site, you know, in the medical school, uh, without the students around, without the faculty around. Um, and so I think it's going to bring a, a sense of life back to uh, here, as uh, you know, we hear about we're all suffering from COVID fatigue and want to get beyond this. But we also need to remember that just because we're vaccinated, uh, you know, at least right now, there are real problems going on in the world and in the community. I think I just saw it yesterday or this morning that, you know, the most cases ever, India is having a real problem uh, with the COVID vaccine. Uh, you know, internationally, a lot of countries are doing that. And there, you know, are several states uh, here. There are pockets of, of really bad uh, COVID activity and in younger people that are winding up getting it and getting sick and winding up in the hospital too. So the older population is, you know, that has settled down. We've been able to handle that, but the younger people. So encouraging people to get vaccines. We've had a robust program for vaccines for the students, uh, offering them the vaccines. Uh, I think it's been a little bit disappointing of the numbers getting the vaccines like that, but uh, medical students all, uh, should all be vaccinated, all had the opportunity to do that. Um, so those are some of just the high level things and you know, happy to answer any questions that people have. Chris, I don't know if there's anything that I, I left out that you would want to add about the COVID return. Chris is actually at the university level, uh, the one that we go to with all the questions about can we do this or should we do this? So I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Chris. I would just add that uh, you and your entire senior leadership team have been great partners in terms of the university's COVID response. Thank you for lending us a couple of uh, folks to help with that effort, including Dr. Kim Miller, the Director of University Health Services, Dr. Art Pancioli, and uh, Dr. Dustin Calhoun. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, help, not just managing the College of Medicine, but playing a huge role in the entire university COVID response. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, questions Fred. or comments? Yeah, mm -hmm. so go ahead and open it up. Just please uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. So Chris was a first year mid student the last time we went to the final four. So yep. he always has those fun facts for us. Yep, 91, 92. So Andy, I'll, I'll ask while people are sort of generating their questions. Um, have, Obviously, things are opening up a little bit more. You talked about students being more involved on campus. Where do you where do you see interview season? What do you interview? Inter what do you anticipate interview season looking at uh, looking like uh, in the fall? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion, ongoing discussion about this, you know, right now, and um, I think that there's a push right now that there's probably leaning towards having virtual interviews for another year to see. But 
Uh, that only works if everybody agrees. Last year, pr pretty much everybody agreed. There are some specialties, there are some programs that people feel, no, we need to have the in-person interviews. There are equity issues you know, with all of this, you know, as, as Dr. Bennett said, the travel costs to get there, who gets selected for interviews. Um, so yeah, I honestly don't know exactly where it's going to play out like that, but uh, it, it's a real problem. Uh, again, you know, would you want to send somebody to a state, you know, to a place where there's a high incidence of COVID at this point, even if they're vaccinated, people traveling around, spreading it more uh, to do things. I think, you know, there's uh, that people are split. I mean, some people thought it went extremely well, and some program directors and some students did with the virtual interviews. There are others who just hated it and were, you know, thought that they couldn't do a good job with it. Uh, but I, I think, you know, in the circles that I'm in, in some of the national circles, uh, there is no one body that controls this, that can say, this is what you know, you can do and, and enforce it uh, at that level of the graduate medical education level uh, for things, unlike the medical schools where the AAMC has a little bit more uh, of doing that. So uh, the residency programs are going to have to make some decisions. Uh, I, I think a lot of them uh, felt that they were able to do okay, but it is hard when you're, you know, selecting people who have never seen the city, they may match to your program and they've never seen the city, never met the people in person. So it's not the interviewing process of judging whether someone it's the fit process and how do you judge that virtually so probably a long-winded roundabout answer to uh, i don't know what's going to happen yet but i think there might be uh some pressures for virtual for again and Andy, that was for med school interviews as well uh the med school uh i think is probably going to be somewhat like that also uh, to do that uh but uh, we'll get that. Aurora, I don't know if, she's, if Aurora's still on and if she knows uh, what the discussions were uh, at that level. I think from the med school perspective, they found that worked pretty well with the multiple mini interviews, you know, to set that up and to do that virtually also. But again, it's the same thing. It's, you know, uh, I think our um, admissions people and student affairs people, uh, this, that's a selection process. You know, and I think that can be done virtually. It's a recruitment process where they bring them on campus and they show the spirit, they show the enthusiasm, get them exposed to lots of students uh, and alumni. That's the part that we miss virtually. The selection process goes a little bit easier, but uh, our team has been absolutely uh, phenomenal in getting the uh, recruitment part of that job and showing the students you know, really representing what UC is all about, the culture here and the things of that, so. Great, um, so I'm gonna, there's a question from um, Dr. Sawyer in the chat that I'm gonna read you and then um, my friend Joni Linhart has a question. So first this one, um, since we are training future clinicians, um, we should be able to bring all students back and teach effective infection prevention techniques in any situation by training them early using the best PPE. And Dr. Sorry, I wonder if you had any thoughts on this and maybe specifically, is there somebody in the college that maybe he could reach out to to sort of talk about, you know, maybe piloting or doing a QI project that um, maybe somebody at the College of Medicine would be interested in partnering with him on? Yeah, so a couple of things. One is we are planning on bringing the students back and are planning on bringing them back, you know, knowing that uh, the rules that Dr. Lewis is uh, helping to define for us. One is that masks will be required. You know, we're talking about social distancing and will that be required as far as the number of students in a room, six foot distance versus three foot distance. All of those are under active discussion to see to how we can do this safely. Uh, if people are vaccinated, they can all be together. The problem is that we have people in public spaces going in and out. They're not, it's not a closed building. Uh, the, the building has, you know, more public access in the future. Uh, so we do teach them uh, appropriate PPE, make sure that they have that. We enforce that here. I would reach out to Phil Diller, uh, you know, uh, Will, about any, you know, possible, you know, studies or things that that, that you might want to do uh, and do things. He's in charge of all the educational stuff like that. So I would talk out to Phil because I think there, you know, we now have a large undergraduate component too in the college, the mid-sci. I'm not as worried about the medical students 
because you know they get it a little bit more, but the med sci students and the public health students are ones that uh, there may be some good opportunities there uh, to work with Phil and the team on that. So I would approach Phil and see where that would go. Yeah, actually I already have. Good. So here's actually part of it is all of the clinic in years, they're face to face sick patients. So I see them in the practice here because I was doing it with students and they are contaminating their facial mucous membranes at high risk, high risk. So I think to start day one, telling them my eyes, nose and mouth need to be covered to protect themselves. And then you begin that and suddenly you see is very different than any other medical school in the country. We've instituted these known strategies, like Dr. Fauci said, July 29th last year, one time. And that sets us apart because the students go out in the public and they're exposed, nose and mouth masks cover, you know, 60%, not 100. So it's such a key part of infection prevention, patient safety, and, you know, health and wellness for students in their clinical years. Why not start it now? I've, I've talked to many of the people you mentioned about these programs, studies done in 2014 by myself and Nancy Elder, and 2015 in Australia by, with medical students, and they're unconsciously contaminating their mucous membrane. So, so, I mean, I don't know, when do we start it today? UC is doing it, opening campuses, coming together. You don't need to be three or six feet apart, just you know, protect all of your mucous mem mu membranes, much like we do in the clinical setting. That's my thought. I can't. Thanks. Well, it, maybe I think, you know, we could definitely take this offline and yeah, uh, sort of you know, work on kind of seeing what we can do. I've got a few thoughts on it, too, maybe involving a couple of the clerkship directors. So I'd be happy to talk with you online. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Joni, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and unmute and ask your ask Andy your question. Well, Dr. Felek, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good. Great. I think I did. You know, I'm not as computer technical as the rest of you. Um, Living here in Florida, we had a tremendous rollout of the COVID vaccine, and almost everyone where we live has received the two doses because most of us are over 65. I was a little bit uh, disturbed to hear you talk about the medical students that are not vaccinating themselves. Um, I had to visit a dermatologist, and the two women that helped the dermatologist had also refused uh, the COVID vaccine. And when you when I ask them, why did you refuse it? Uh, the, their questions were, there's not enough science. I'm worried that it hasn't been tested enough. And uh, there are several pediatricians on this call. And we pediatricians vaccinate everything that walks in the door multiple times. So um, I would like to know if there is any way to convince some of these students that they need it. I mean, I trained at Children's where there was a rule that Every person in the building had to have the flu vaccine. No exceptions unless you were allergic to a component in the flu vaccine. Uh, I don't think we're going to get there yet. But how do we encourage medical students to get the vaccine? So uh, let me clarify for you, Joni, and, and it's great uh, hearing you. I wish I could see you, but I can't uh, see well, you. Well, I haven't had my hair yet today. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, if the medical students uh, were, are an, an issue. The medical students all had the opportunity to get vaccinated. The vast majority of them did. There might be a couple only maybe because of health reasons, you know, or something like that. Uh, but, you know, the medical students have not been an issue. And what I was talking about is that the university has offered the vaccine and, you know, Governor DeWine had freed up the vaccine for the university at large to do that. And this is what we're seeing nationally. And we had 12,000 doses of vaccine for students. And the uptake wasn't as great at the college level, the university level, not the medical student level. The medical students all uh, are. Um, I think, you know, just going back to one of the things that Will said, you know, also is that, you know, this year, you know, with the what we've learned in trying to protect ourselves from COVID, we've had a significant effect on flu also. Uh, and, you know, one of the statistics I heard is there was like only one death, one pediatric death from the flu nationally this year, which is, you know, a whole lot different than, than things in the past. So, you know, I think these, uh, hopefully some of these uh, hygienic measures that we're doing now are going to be more commonplace 
all the time for everything in healthcare settings and possibly in the population also. But the medical students have done what I anticipate the university will have difficulties, I think, mandating a flu vaccine. That's the university man, uh, mandating a flu vac or a uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, we will have to see how that plays out over time you know, to do things. However, for the medical school, I would anticipate that some of the health systems like Children's and or UC Health may actually put in requirements for COVID vaccines. And then students will have to have it in order to rotate to those sites. Uh, but we have not had an issue with medical students refusing to get the vaccine. Uh, so I just wanted to clear, you know, clarify for that, uh, Joni. Good, thank you. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, Chris, do you want to just unmute and I'll let you sort of have the, we're going to move on, but I want you to, that's an important point that you had, if you want to maybe just share for those that can't see the chat box that are on the phone. I was just adding to Dr. Philak's comments about our COVID response as a university. We were not making uh, decisions in a vacuum. We're in regular conversations with the governor's office, the Ohio Department of Health, our local city and, and county uh, health departments. Uh, so uh, just want to make sure that the whole audience is aware that, you know, we're, we're doing our best with the direction and, and guidance from our own academic health center experts and our physician led COVID response team that includes uh, College of Medicine representatives. But uh, we're, we're also subject to at least having conversations with the, the other entities about what we're doing. And I know Dr. Lofgren has been very involved, you know, regularly meeting probably daily with the governor. So um, Andy, thank you very much. Um, please, if you have some time, I know you're very busy. We'd love for you to stay on. Um, if not, again, we appreciate everything, your leadership and everything you're doing. And uh, please let us know how how we can sort of assist and, and help with, with things in the college. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. We're um, going to go ahead and move on and going to um, introduce um, two of our M1s. And I think this is the first time that they're getting to present to this group. So just going to ask them to kind of give a little bit, you know, uh, let us know where you're from and you know maybe where you went to undergrad anything else you want to share with us so i'm going to turn it over to katherine desmond and joe walden who are going to give us a little bit about what med school has been like for them so far in this first year and some of the activities um that, that they've been participating in so katherine and joe welcome Hey, thanks so much for the welcome. Um, my name is Catherine Desmond. I am from Scottsdale, Arizona and went to University of Southern California for undergrad um, and then did my master's here um, through the special master's program, took a year working at Children's doing some research and now I'm here. Um, let's see. Joe, why don't you take it away? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. Good to see your faces here this morning. Thanks for having us. Um, like Catherine mentioned, my name is Joe. Uh, I'm a first year as well. I grew up in Cincinnati. I'm from the west side. If that means anything to you, I went to LaSalle High School. So go Lancers for our LaSalle fans out there. Um, I did my undergrad at the University of Kentucky. I studied psychology and neuroscience and graduated in the May of 2020. So just last spring. And then now I'm back home to do my medical education here at UC. So very excited to be home. I think my parents are excited too, maybe a little too excited. But um, I'm excited to share a little bit about our first year experience. Um, are we OK to share our screen real quick? We have a few slides to share. Probably. Let's see. Sometimes my computer gets upset at me when I do this, but we'll, we'll roll with it. So as we're pulling up our screen, um, we just created a few slides to kind of give an overview of what our first year looked like. Um, so you all can kind of get a feel for what it's been even with um, COVID-19 and the, a lot of the positives we've still experienced um, despite kind of the pandemic. Can everyone see um, the slides? I can't yep. see anyone's faces. They're good, go right ahead. Perfect, so we introduced ourselves. This is just a super brief overview of our presentation. We wanted to give a quick um, touch on what MSA is and what we've been up to this year. Um, and then we'll go over kind of how COVID has impacted our coursework and our curricular experiences. And we wanna talk about what our student community has looked like this year um, despite the pandemic. And then we have a few class specific updates we wanted to share before we open it up for Q&A. So Catherine's gonna kick us off with a quick intro and overview of MSA. Yeah, so we know that you guys, you know, probably know what MSA does already, but definitely in COVID times, our role has shifted a bit. So, I mean, I think in, I think uh, historically MSA was largely um, event oriented and kind of organizing all of that stuff. But obviously this year that has changed a bit. Um, 
it's our our role has been heavily emphasizing the liaison between students and administration to address various concerns. Um, we have been trying to do like some virtual events and various community building activities, but and of course still approving student orgs. But um, that has been kind of the the primary focus. We did still help help out with Match Week a little bit and um, figure out what community service is possible during COVID. But um, our primary role has been kind of addressing student concerns and figuring out how we can how we can move forward. Yes, now getting into a little bit more of kind of what this year's looked like, especially for us in our first year experience amid a pandemic. Um, as you all are likely aware, and we, we've been talking about, you know, just at, before we hopped on here, um, is that many of our activities have been moved virtually. Um, lectures have been given almost exclusively over Zoom since um, that Thanksgiving time, and we've bounced between WebEx and Teams as well, trying to find the best fit for us. Um, and then we've also done, you know, mandatory discussions like you know ethics type discussions or or patient presentations all virtually over zoom or webex um, but we've still been able to maintain like the student-led tutoring sessions as well virtually and we've also been able to maintain exams and exam reviews kind of using whatever technology we might have exemplify honor lock um things like that to ensure that exams are still safe and you know giving everyone the same experience um, but also everyone can do that safely from their own home so we've been thankful for those experiences and although a lot of it has been virtual, we still have you know, been able to maintain that kind of consistency of lecture going and the consistency of reviewing a lecture afterwards because the lectures are still recorded. Um, we've also been able to maintain that Q&A throughout a lecture as well. Um, some of you may have given lectures for us at some point, um, but we, the, the chat function has been a, a, a hot button for us this year um, with a lot of discussion going through the chat or people just unmuting or raising their hands. So lecture still has been you know, as, it would, as it would be expected and still a positive experience. Um, but th some things have been not so virtual, and Catherine was going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so we've had some stuff using a hybrid model. So for clinical skills, um, just the student performing the physical exam in the group of four goes virtually, joins a Zoom call. The history is done, um, distanced with everyone outside of the room, um, and then the student performing the physical exam goes inside and um, does the physical exam, and then the clinical skills cameras that are kind of showing what's going on in the room is shown in the Zoom call so that everyone can see what's going on. Um, let's see, uh, LPCC was both virtual and in person. So I think up until, I want to say March, it was all virtual. Um, and then once we it had reached kind of two weeks post-vaccine, I think there was maybe a little bit of time. And then um, we ended up doing LPCC in person and that has continued through now. Um, and then some some uh, school activities were in person using full PPE. So first responder skill sessions in August were completed in person. Anatomy labs have all been in person, um, but distance. So they spread out the labs a little bit so that like, like even tables, odd tables, and then spread out the anatomy uh, donors to several rooms instead of all being in the same room. Um, clinical skills practice sessions are still in person with full PPE. Um, tutoring, anatomy tutoring is in person. Um, and then the study lounge space is still available. The library may be closed, but there is still quite a bit of space for us to study on campus. We are still looking forward, of course, to things coming back to normal eventually, but things have still been good this year. And uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about more student life stuff. Yeah, 100 percent. So, you know, the big question, I think, for a lot of folks moving virtually was how would students get to meet each other and how would students kind of get settled in? The Cincinnati community because it is such a strong component of the UCOM experience. Um, and although a lot of things have been moved virtually or hybrid, I, I think between me and Catherine, we've definitely seen students still making connections and I know our personal experiences have still been very positive, even if that has been in smaller circles or, or branching out, you know, to smaller amounts of people um, from time to time. So, you know, into the specifics, like second look weekend, I think as many know, was fully virtual. That was smack in the middle of the height of COVID. Um, orientation was kind of a hybrid approach um, where we were able to watch lectures from home, whether that was on our own time or like as a big group with the rest of our class. Um, but we also did have a chance to go in person to MSB. We did some team building and met some of our, our classmates there during that first week. And we also got a tour of MSB and, and got, you know, the essentials like our mask and our face shield and um, our badges. And then something that UC did incredibly well that I had, hadn't seen any other school, you know, that I knew of do was they really emphasized our opportunity to meet people socially while maintaining safety and distance. So throughout that first week of orientation, every night there were probably 10 or 12 
different activities that were offered, maybe even 20, um, and they were capped at 10 people. And the, the, those signups were kept strictly, but it offered kind of everyone a chance to go out and go hiking or get ice cream or, you know, go go on a walk um, in a, a park somewhere. And it was kind of structured so that you could go do that as a part of orientation and meet some of your classmates, but still kind of maintain the safety that you were so longing for. Um, and I think from my experience, it honestly made it even that much more enjoyable because they were smaller groups. You could kind of hone in on people a little a little more closely. And also everyone knew that that was their chance to, to meet you and get to know you. So and it was almost as if everyone was even more eager to talk and even more eager to ex exchange numbers because they knew that was their chance um, because things were going to be so, so difficult and so isolated for those first few weeks. Um, and bouncing off of that, another kind of big positive of the COVID kind of experience for our class was that a lot of side group chats were made from our main big class group chat that we use for communication um, based off of interest and, you know, sports and things like that, things that could be maintained even after orientation. So even if people couldn't cook together, there's a, a food group chat that shares pictures of their cooking and, and talks about cooking together. There's a group chat that talks about policy and politics. There's group chats that organize hiking and social distance activities, um, which has made it for like a much more fruitful kind of extracurricular experience, even if we're not able to meet people in the lecture halls like we would in the past. And um, then we also a lot, a lot of virtual kind of open door, open office hour activities have been offered as well throughout this year, which has made it um, very accessible for students to kind of talk and, and get their concerns answered. And then in terms of some more kind of specific events, the community building stuff that either we or like other groups like Student Wellness Committee have done. So um, our historian has a lot of um, Instagram takeovers to kind of help to learn about different student reps. So I think everyone in MSA has done one. I think a lot of our curriculum reps have done one as well. Um, just to kind of get so people know who, who is representing them and what's going on. Um, she also has a Pets of UCOM series that is very popular. Um, <laughs> And then the, um, I very much enjoy that one. Um, the Student Wellness Committee has also offered virtual virtual and socially distant wellness activities. Um, so they had a virtual water coloring class that I went to, it was very nice. Um, and then they had an ice cream social recently for the M2s during their end of block week where they left um, ice cream, like little single serving ones in the freezer and then also to different toppings and let them know that they could get it whenever they would like. Um, there have also been all sorts of various lunch talks, virtual dinner with docs, um, different events that have all been done in a, I think those have been mostly virtual, um, but there have been a few, few service events that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, we did an end of block raffle after fundamentals of molecular medicine. So normally with the funding that we would have used to like have an, uh, an in-person celebration, we did a raffle. Um, and so that's a photo of Joe in a mask and face shield and his roommate that coincidentally won on their front porch. Um, There's a little but, bit of controversy, but it was, it was yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's some, some questions of nepotism, but it was it was legit. Um, and then the M4 co-presidents did a virtual match day celebration that we helped out with a little bit. People seem to really enjoy that. Um, and then the large scale events have been postponed until further notice, but um, we have still been preparing for some of those now just because we know that this isn't forever. Um, and so, you know, maintaining deposits, figuring out potential dates for the next year, um, et cetera. Certainly. So overall, like, I think we've talked about a lot of this throughout our, our presentation. It's been difficult and certainly been difficult on some students who may have had more higher higher risk family members or who, who may live alone as opposed to living with roommates. Um, but I think this year has been really good and, and really shown a lot of adaptability among the student body and among the administration. Um, and I think students have really taken advantage of the chances that they have been offered to meet each other um, and get to know the school a little bit. And now that we've been vaccinated, that was a huge step um, for many of us and like a, a big relief. Like I can just remember the, the huge collective sigh that many I think shared on the night we learned we were getting vaccinated. Um, and since then, things have started to slowly open back up a little bit for the the more essential type activities like the opening of our student run free clinics and the opening of our community service activities, um, which we know is a major pool for many students to come to UC. Um, and I think many have been thrilled to see kind of that getting back up and running, even if it has been, you know, looking a little different or a little slower than they would have um, originally expected coming here. Um, and obviously we look forward to more in-person opportunities <laughs> in the days ahead and we're very excited for that. Um, so we wanted to wrap up our presentation just with some updates from our class and some things that we've been working on in addition to those activities we shared. So Catherine, take it away. Yeah, so um, I 
I'm sure some of you at least have been wondering about the clothing sale. We have been hearing a lot about it. Uh, basically, there was an issue with UC Trademark. And so we are now going through the Trademark Office. Um, and what they do is they set up an online clothing store with your designs through Champion. So all of the products will be Champion. And it will be an online store that's available year round that like will ship straight to you when you order online. Um, Champions is really backed up, so it hasn't been happening yet. But um, once it's available, we'll make everyone aware. Um, and allegedly, we are very close. So <laughs> you keep an eye out for that. Um, we also approved for new, four new student orgs this year, the Aerospace Medicine Interest Group, Public Health Interest Group, Civil Discussions Group, and Interventional Radiology Interest Group. So it's very exciting. Um, and we had a virtual leadership transition, um, and then student wellness committee and us, um, and also curriculum committees and many other people, uh, work to call every M1 and M2 over winter break, um, to do kind of a mental health check-in and connect students with resources if they needed any. Um, and then service events are still happening and the 2021 orientation in the fall is slated to be much more in person. Uh, and then I think I've heard talk of a tentative in-person white coat, so exciting to be moving forward great wow you guys that was amazing um i i, I have been on this council for 20 years and, and this was you guys you guys hit it out of the park so thank you for you know really engaging your class and and, and your fellow students I, i'm really impressed um and i will say the the overall the university alumni associations using that champion site i actually have a shirt on under here that's from it there's some nice stuff on that so i, I'm, I think we're really looking forward to that um, I'm going to ask if if anyone, if any of our alumni have questions or comments, if you wouldn't mind putting them in the chat, because I want to make sure that our development team has enough time. Um, so maybe guys, if Catherine and Joe, you guys could stay on for a few minutes and maybe answer questions as they come up in the chat. That way um, our, our members get a chance to interact with you. And we look forward to having you back um, at our next meeting and, and um, when you guys are second years and, and hearing where you're at. So thank you so much. Um, Mary Jo, Kim and Gabe, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. MJ, do you want to start or do you want me to go? Why don't you go ahead? You're not okay. following. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, thanks everybody for having us. And I agree with Chris. That was a great presentation. Congratulations to our students. That was really, really, really well done. I'm looking forward to some of those pieces. We were just talking about those before you guys got on. Um, a couple of things in, from a fundraising perspective, uh, things are going are, are going all right. I know that we were a little concerned as we came into the year, but um, we just as why, while we were on this, I just got notification that we just signed a $3.7 million gift. So that will take uh, the College of Medicine up to $9 million. Um, we're close to goal. And we have about $6 million plus in the pipeline to close by the end of June. So that's pretty exciting, um, including potentially three endowed chairs. Um, most recently, you might have seen that we just um, uh, closed a, a, a big gift for um, an endowed chair for, I mean, for research for, from a, a woman named Jules Brown for um, $1.5 million. So that's pretty exciting as well. That will go into research. And she also did a $5,000 um, $5, new gift so that we can do some research with Dan Hassett. So that's something that's coming down the pike and you'll be seeing that as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our scholarship luncheon. It went I thought it went really well. Again, it was virtual, but I wanted to um, do a shout out because I was in Dr. Woodside's um, room and we had a really great time with our students. So that was super fun. I think, Joe, you were in there too. We had a great time. Um, I, I did want to make one comment. One of the things that was brought up after that, um, you know, we had some students not respond to the invitation from scholarship luncheon, which was really disappointing um, from my perspective. But I mean, you know, I think one of the things from a very human perspective that Abby brought up to me that I thought was really helpful was that I've got to remember that, you know, even though we think that all of these sh students should participate in things like that, that it's a possibility that some of them might be a tad bit intimidated into participating, um, just having maybe never had and, and the way Abby described it as from her as being a, um, a first year of, of, a, of a first gen student that it's it's a t it's a tad bit intimidating to participate in something with docs, um, you know, not necessarily in her from her perspective, being part of the country club crowd is how, which how she described it for her own her own experiences. So I just wanted to, um, you know, it probably it brought me back down to earth as a reminder that our expectations sometimes of students, I mean, it, it should be high, especially when they receive 
receive a scholarship, but we also, you know, from a human perspective, need to re remind ourselves that we have to be, we have to help students understand and 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 really be careful in making sure that they're comfortable in participating in events like this. Because I just didn't even think of it that way, and that really came out of, you know, from her own experience. So I just wanted to bring that up. I know that MJ does a great job. Um, with the uh, the dinners that they'll do starting in August. Um, and I know a lot of, of, of you all participate in that. But again, I think that there's, you know, any way that we can help students feel more comfortable in coming to these kind of events, I think is really, really good. So um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is the Think Forward event that Chris um, participated in last week, which I thought was really well done. Um, we had, it was a, a leadership event, and then we um, we had a, a keynote speaker who spoke, who was a graduate of the University of Cincinnati, who did an amazing job. And then they moved us over into our own rooms. Um, Dr. Marvin Slepian and Dr. Pancioli talked a lot about um, COVID, about COVID, about, you know, how they, how they both have similar roles in their institutions, University of um, Arizona in Tucson for Dr. Uh, Slepian and how they really were able to, um, you know, how they how, how they instructed the universities to carry on and then talked a lot about what's gonna happen post COVID. So, um, you know, and how the, some of the things are gonna change. So I thought that was really well done, very exciting. Um, Dr. Slepian is always just priceless. He's just such a great person, on, you know, uh, alumni for on, speak on our behalf. And, and of course, Dr. Pancioli, everyone knows Dr. Pancioli. Um, he got a little, uh, he got a little teary, teary eyed. So I thought that was really, you know, that was interesting as well. Um, you know, a, a lot of exhaustion over the last year as far as our physicians go. So that was really helpful. Um, we also have a, um, a new VP coming in, Jonathan Agri. Um, we'll be able to do an introduction with him for you, for all of you in the next couple months. I think he starts May 15th. Really exciting coming from George Washington University. So um, a lot of experience in cancer and integrative health. So I think that that will be helpful for all of us. Looking forward to introducing him to you. <laughs> and um, the other thing, I guess I did touch base. We are 9.1 million towards goal of 10 million, but we also have over $10 million in closes in cancer and neuroscience. So uh, a, a good year for us, even though we, we had some challenges with COVID. Um, I know that Gabe is working really closely with MJ on um, some of the uh, reunion years and, and doing some scholarship fundraising around that. And I know there's been some su success around that too. So I just wanted to bring that up and I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna hand it over to Mary Jo. Thanks, Kim. Um, I'm going to start out by just recapping that uh, Alumni Week happened last week. And um, as you might expect, it was all virtual. But I wanted to take a minute to shout out for Chris Lewis, who was the Marion A. Spencer Mosaic Award recipient. Yay. And then another of our alumni, uh, Dr. Marty Samuels from Boston, uh, was outstanding alumni for the College of Medicine through this celebration. There's a large mural painted on the side of a building in downtown Cincinnati. It's at 1430 Vine Street. So if you happen to be down there enjoying a nice dinner, you might want to see the mural. It's pretty cool looking. So um, congratulations to, to both of those uh, folks from our, our alumni base. Um, and then white coat, I know it's that that word has been touched on a couple times in this conversation and hopefully our white coat ceremony, our orientation week will be able to be live and in person. Uh, we will continue with the tradition of the new student dinners. Um, so many of you participate in that and hopefully that will be able to be in person. We we explored the virtual approach last time and it worked out fine, but nothing replaces the in-person. So um, watch for those invitations to be a host to a group of students during your orientation week. Um, and then as far as supporting the students with words of wisdom and as a gift of the White Coat, we will continue with the White Coat sponsorship program. It's a pretty cool way to just write a little note from you that is special for that individual that is receiving the white coat. Um, it, it just lets them know that they've become part of a really important family <clears throat> and their, <clears throat> excuse me, their support there for the students. So again, watch for that to be coming out within the next month as well. Um, 
and then lastly, I wanted to touch on reunion. We did send an electronic save the date out. Um, we have reunion scheduled for November 4th through the 6th. Uh, this fall, it's going to be over homecoming weekend, and we'll celebrate our zero and five classes from the canceled reunion along with our ones and sixes. So it should be quite the party. Um, we did, of course, put a disclaimer on there uh, about public health and and hopefully we're in a really good place in November and that's not going to cause another pause and a reschedule for reunion. So we're moving full steam ahead with getting that planned. Um, the schedule is going to be a little different than usual, not for the Friday. Uh, we'll still have our College of Medicine tours and um, hear from our Dean, uh, have our celebration at, at the Hilton. Uh, Saturday though, we have some opportunity because it's homecoming. So we're trying to figure out how to make that all work, um, considering we only find out 12 days beforehand what time the game starts, but we'll, we'll have a fun and different unique schedule for for everybody that hopefully everyone's excited about for reunion. Um, and that's, do if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer those for you. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Gabe. Um, thanks, MJ. Uh, you know, I think Kim covered a significant portion of development kind of fundraising. Um, what I would share is that uh, despite, I shared a little bit in the chat as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, but I think the the upside or the, or the, not upside, but the happy circumstances of our reality is that despite the incredible challenges that we faced over the last year, um, and not just from a fundraising perspective, but obviously all those challenges impact our ability to fundraise. We've been um, somewhat, you know, surprised that people have come out in, in um, I won't say greater numbers, but in uh, you know relatively similar numbers as years past. Um, typically, when when there are times of crisis like this, people's giving tends to not necessarily shrink, but get refined in the sense that they may decide to give to fewer numbers of institutions and spread their dollars that they have in, uh, across a, a smaller number of, of organizations. So I think that helps to balance out some of the you know what, what we might have expected to be a downturn some folks became even more generous while others maybe decided they needed to either give to other institutions or um kind of take a year off but what we're seeing now is that as things improve some of those folks who maybe had to take a year off are coming back even stronger than than before because they want to make up in some sense for having missed that opportunity to give uh last year um, for me, you know, we've got, I've got some gifts I'm excited about coming down, uh, down the pike, um, mostly on the endowed scholarship front, which as, as I'm sure all of you know, from hearing from us over, you know, many meetings, endowments are so important to the longevity and the kind of, um, confidence that the college has, um, year to year, as opposed to having to chase those dollars that get awarded. They're both very important and, and they both create the lifeblood of the institution, but having the, the legacy and the the confidence year after year of the endowed scholarships uh, is something that we continue to be to focus on as an area of of opportunity and and need for the college. So um, keep an eye out. You know some of these gifts that I I didn't go into detail about may become more public in the coming weeks and months as they get finalized, and we're excited to announce those. Um, but it's it's been a, a challenging but also very rewarding year. And if anybody has individual questions about scholarships um, or about uh, numbers. I'm certainly happy to share those, but I didn't want to bog you down with with too many figures at the end of a you know a long meeting. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Gabe and, and Mary Jo and Kim. And just again, just a shout out to you guys. You guys have an amazing team and and Jeff's on the call too. So thank you so much. And Katie RC uh, was very instrumental on the day of giving. She was on the meetings with me once a month and, and Dolores Dotson was also very helpful. So you guys just have an amazing team and I, and I love working with you. So thank you all. Um, we are about out of time. Um, Ann Weikert's had her hand raised, and I want to give her a chance to ask her question or make her comment. So before we um, head off, Ann, I'm going to let you unmute and go ahead and ask your question or make your comment. 
I think I just got mixed up of whether my hand was up or down. I didn't. That's have fine. Do. Not a problem. All right. Well, um, just a couple of um, our next meeting is going to be October 21st, um, 2021, and we'll have an update on Honors Day um, that'll be taking place in May. And then for those of you that are on the Distinguished Alumni Selection Committee, why don't we maybe take a two minute break? We're gonna, it's gonna be on this line, so don't hang up. Uh, maybe take a minute or two, um, and then we'll come back and um, Heather will take over with that. Have a great, great rest of the week, everybody. Thanks for everything you do. Take care, stay safe. Take care, Joe. Mary, Mary Jo, I got to jump off at 11, so I will stay on, um, assuming this goes that long, um, but just wanted to, to bring that up. I can uh, throw out my two cents kind of before 11 or as we have time. I just, last time I don't think it took that long, but, and I, and I don't know how many we are, are picking, but uh, I got a, a hard cutoff for some interviews. Totally understand. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll probably go through it pretty quickly. Um, it just depends on when we go we go down to the you know you can always just let us know your choices in the order from one to six if you have to get off and we haven't gotten to that point yet okay not trying to be difficult oh no <laughs> that's how you it that way hey mary joe is there a way for um us to, for me to see everyone or no how do i do that um if you go up to the three dots at the top of your screen do you have see where it says more action Yes. And then just um, 